special edition of the SSE show. We're going to be talking about Super Bowl marketing, what works in business and what doesn't, and all the advertising, and of course the commercials. Everybody wants to talk about the commercials. Our guest tonight, New York Giants Vice President of Corporate Partnerships, John McGuire, and the former Chief Marketing Officer of the New England Patriots, an author, supposedly a really good author he told me, President and CEO of Trinity One, Lou Imbriano. And these two guys used to work together at WEEI Radio. Everybody's heard of that station in Boston, okay? And, of course, we're going to introduce all the panels and everybody involved. What we'll do is we'll start first with you, John. Tell me, now we're talking about the Super Bowl. You work with the New York Giants. Defending champions, I could have said that, right, about 24 hours ago. That's defending champions. The defending champions. What does it do? First, we're going to look at the team side. What does a Super Bowl do for a team, not just for the individual players, but for the business side? Well, uh, it, it really depends. We won the Super Bowl back in 2007. I'm not sure the, um, the team was ready for the, the immediate success the Super Bowl brought. Um, but with both the, the Super Bowl itself coming to New York, uh, we've had to ramp up, and then by surprise, we won it last year. I think everyone will agree. Uh, but we had a team in place that was ready to monetize the Super Bowl, and I think we've gone probably quadruple sales probably in the last four years, but that's really more due to the team success, the branding, and the 85 years behind the Giants. But once you get a Super Bowl in your belt uh, and you get a second one, you don't make the same mistakes twice. So, so we just essentially uh, locked everyone down for long-term contracts, um, sold the entire stadium out soup to nuts. So, I mean, there's – yeah, we're pretty we're pretty uh, pretty full as a Giants um, sponsorship team as well as a suite team and a ticket team. So it's been a pretty good run. And we'll go with Lou in a minute. I want to ask one more follow up, and then uh, we'll go for Lou, and then we'll ask everybody else can ask a question. Okay. So um, tell me, uh, Lou has brought this up before too. It's not just about winning, but when you get this opportunity, it's not just about the game. You got to market during the week of, and then after, and then where. Where is the big push for you guys? Is it actually after winning, or is it during, or before, or where? Well, for, for the, the entire sponsorship team, the season really doesn't start till the day after the Super Bowl, regardless. So, I mean, our, our big push now starts, you know, when the team is off and no one's in the building, is when the sponsorship team does their work. Um, you know, we'll run this thing up through mid-July, um, end of July, through the training camp. But, you know, during the season is when you build the relationships uh, because you have the access to the team, you have access to uh, the training facility, you have the access to the games and what happens on the field. So once people are engaged, then you're in a situation where, you know, you just want to convert that engagement into relationships and turn those relationships into money. Okay. Lou, you've been to a few Super Bowls. You said 18, but you were with the New England Patriots as the chief marketing officer. What kind of stuff did you take advantage of? Give some people some examples of uh, creativity that you utilize the Super Bowl for. Well, we looked at the uh, Super Bowl as a way to generate revenue right away. And so we uh, created this TRIPS program and a hospitality program where we took many of our club members, suite holders, and, and folks with discretionary cash uh, to the Super Bowl. We we leased five at the time DC 10s and we would have 12 different hotels with different rooms and parties and we charge 15,000 a couple to come down and enjoy it and between that and the other pieces of hospitality as well as some broadcast things the team could generate 10 plus million dollars just in that two week period and we did a nice job at, at, at uh, bringing incremental revenue in in that short window of time and speaking of sponsors a uh, good segue there um just look over my shoulder uh sponsors for tonight uh we have some and i didn't win a super bowl i've been to nine but these are our sponsors ups do more with ups jet blue book now at jetblue.com and bud light the official sponsor of the nfl here we go and bud light by the way budweiser won the ad Add a, Addy Awards for USA Today is the best commercial. Huh? How about that? And they're one of our sponsors tonight. That was a good segue, Lou. Way to, way to toss in our sponsors. <laughs> All right. So if anybody has a question, please raise up your hands. If not, we're going to keep rolling here. Um, how, we're talking about sponsorships and, and all that kind of stuff. John, now you've, uh, uh, you know, in the old days it was just, hey, uh, get the sponsor banner up, get all this stuff. But with new technology, social media, interactive stuff, how much more creative can teams be with sponsorship packages? Um, Chris, could you repeat that, please? 
Yeah. yeah. How much more creative can teams be nowadays with new media, with sponsorship packages and their sponsors? Well, if you consider what, what I think a lot of the teams do is if you if you take, for example, um, the cable companies that do what bundle pricing, where you buy, um, you know, you're going to buy your telephone, your internet, your on-demand, your six channels, your 300 basic channels. Um, they're going to try and bundle everything so you can get a, a value price out of the deal. What you want to do as a sponsorship team is you want to make sure that every single piece of inventory that you have is monetized. Now, the good news is is the digital stuff is fairly infinite. You can create as much as you want. Um, the broadcast stuff has its limitations because you only have so much to put in a game. So you want to take a little bit from the broadcast. You want to take a little bit from the digital media. Uh, you want to pile on as much as you can. You want to have tickets, suites. You want to sell every single, a little bit of every single thing you can and as much as you can, depending on the size of the advertiser and the size of the relationship. So, so really the focus is, is to make sure that every single sale brings everything you have as a team together okay, and gives it to the customer. So when he, when he goes on the field early before the game or has a big barbecue with alumni and then he, he sees himself. Johnny, is that guy behind you playing pool? He is. He is. <laughs> I know. I know. This is unbelievable. Do we have a pool sponsorship here? Yeah, that's coming up next. But, you know, essentially, you know, and, and, you know, to go a little bit back to the Super Bowl, is you want to make sure that, that Thank you, Luke. you all the sponsorship stuff, that you have every, all, all of your customers are already contracted for the playoffs. So, so that you don't have to go back to them and say, hey, let's generate more revenue. You know, the second we made the playoffs, we had $10 million in the books because it was all contracted. Whereas in 2007, we didn't have any contracts. So we had to go ask people for money to go to the Super Bowl this, this time around or, or last year as the defending champion, one day removed. Um, you know, we have <laughs> all lined up and done. And now, you know, you know, as, and every contract we have now has the provision as we go into the playoffs that it's automatic. So so if anyone's interested in, on the team side of doing that, it has to be a prerequisite to signing a contract because you don't want to have to go hunting for someone's budget on January 15th or, or January 21st when they're into the next year's budget. You want to budget it the year before. Absolutely. Interesting. And Lou, thank you for pointing out the pool. I was trying to figure that out. Now I see it. Where are you? What? What? Who's playing pool behind you? I, I'm in the common area. My computer broke down, so I had to I had to punt and come down to the common area of my building. Awesome, awesome. Well, if you want to bring the pool player on later, we can get him on the show. I'm gonna break okay, a stick on his neck in a minute. Kempton, uh, you had a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question, uh, John. So I want to ask you, John, uh, what are the current uh, existing strategy and plan that you have? With interacting or engaging your your fans on Twitter, for example, how do you like during the seasons and especially during uh, the playoff or the Super Bowl? Well, honestly, the the, the you know we we're and Luke can speak to this because he worked on the Patriots. The Patriots are a brand that were about thirty or forty years old. The Giants are eighty five years old, so they're more of a they're more of a um, a birthright than they are um, a fan base. So if your father was a Giants fan, his father was a Giants fan. You're a Giants fan, and what you want to do is you want to get the entire nation all dialed into the Twitter, dialed into online. If, if any bit of news comes out, you want to be the first to break that news. You want to break it on Twitter because everybody who's a Giants fan, we, you know, we have millions and millions of Twitter followers and, and online users and, and you know, the entire set of digital assets available to us. You know, we've quadrupled in maybe the last two years the number of people that are actually participating with the Giants. But the way you keep them engaged for 365 days a year is you try and make events, the draft, um, big fan events. You try and do something at the stadium. You try and do telephone calls from Eli Manning. You want the ticket. You want all the fans um, engaged at all times because you just never want to lose them to another team here in the marketplace. So, I mean, we're in New York where we have another football team. We have a, two basketball teams, two hockey teams, two everything. Um, yeah. so, so we're competing – with another 15 teams, and, and our real sales pitch is, look, it's a birthright. And what's a giant, always a giant. And if you stick that core base, and that's really, you know, that if, if, if that's your team, and, and it was handed down to you from your father and his father, then you're going to follow every single bit of information that comes down the pike. So you want to be the first with the information. You want to make sure you blast it out to everybody. So they, they, you know, you want the dogs eating the dog food, essentially. And that's what we use the digital media to do, is probably more than anything. I like that called a birthright, and it's true. It's uh, you're gonna follow the team you went to the games with your dad. I did the same thing. You're not gonna like the team that I was part of, but that's okay. Dallas Cowboys. 
<laughs> you. We, I know, we hate you guys. It's all right. It's a good, but you know what? That's what it's all about. The rivalries make it. The NFC East has incredible rivalries. I mean, there's the Cowboys, Giants, Cowboys, Eagles, Eagles, uh, Giants. I mean, I can go on and on. Lou, and, and it what doesn't do you think matter about all this stuff, this new technology, and how should brands and how should teams be uh, utilizing it? Well, I, I, it, there definitely should be different spokes of the wheel. I mean, it, there has to be an all-encompassing marketing plan and a strategy. It, you can't just have a, a social media strategy and nothing else. That, that would be ridiculous. That's one spoke of the wheel. And, you know, I'm a big believer that you, you don't want to be pounding advertising right in people's faces. Right? You don't <laughs> I like want to that. Be do Jet Blue. <laughs> Go, Lou. <laughs> so, no, I, I think it, it really, and all kidding aside, you really have to have a strategy that, that, that hits everybody in different, because we all have different interests. We all have different things that we like to do. It has to be an all-encompassing campaign. And, Chris, when, when um, you know, you're looking at two very different um, situations, the Giants are 85 years so it's fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, etc. Yeah. Well, remember, and I think it was the year was 1985, because I'm actually a Patriots fan, um, and, and being from Boston, you know, they were voted by Sports Illustrated as the worst, single worst franchise in the history of sport. Front That's cover, release of all those things. Lou took that over, and, and I mean, they probably had, a, uh, if they had $2 million worth of sponsorship in the early 90s, that would be a lot. And along came this new ownership group, rebranded, re-everything, reintroduced, took advantage of the digital, and, and really the, the Patriots as you know them are really about 10 years old. Okay, maybe 20. Yeah. That's the best. Good this point. is the same off wine and then craft. The Giants are 85 years, so we have legacy upon legacy upon legacy. Lou had to, to put the instant drink into the water and make an instant brand and then act like they were the biggest brand in the history of the world, which they did. And, and then, you know, anyone who's Anyone who's 20 years or younger only knows the Patriots as a phenomenal franchise, as the model for the league, okay? The Patriots were the worst franchise in the history of sport, and Lou and his team changed all that wow. by taking advantage of all the things that came through the system at a very unique time. Granted, getting number 12 and Bill Belichick didn't hurt either, but it was the ownership group and the leadership. You know, it, Look, it's not hard to represent the Giants. If they go 2-14, 82,000 people are coming to watch the game. Okay, but the Patriots were two and fourteen forever, and they have they never had a legacy, and they have built this legacy in one business cycle, which is really the difference between the Patriots and the Giants. The Giants have eighty five years behind them, so they're they're going to succeed just by being the Giants. The Patriots had to do it with speed, and they had to do it with cunning, and it was it's a whole different business model, and that's the beauty of the league, especially if you look around right now. I mean, if I have the Seattle franchise, which is not a very um, it hasn't been a very strong sponsorship franchise. They can get that franchise to top five in a minute because of the excitement wrapped around that particular team. San Francisco, same way, building a stadium. You know, they have some history. But if you're 20 years old, you know San Francisco is a terrible team. You don't know them as a four-time Super Bowl champion. Right, right. You know, Mike Singletary and three wins and all that stuff. San Francisco has a chance to, to run this thing crazy. But then you take a look at something like the Jets franchise, which is a, an interesting model, biggest market in the world. Okay, more money available to that particular market than any market in the country in the world, and they take it out of their own way right now. So it's so it's, you know you take the individual team and you apply the set of circumstances. Okay, for the sponsorship, and you know if you're if you have a great management team like they did with the Patriots and Lou, you know you go to number one. You know remember Boston's market rank is number twelve. I think Dallas is number. 11, and Dallas is number one in revenue. It's Dallas Patriots. Hey, Giants. hey, our market's number five now, media market, by the way. Is it? Yes, it is. Wow. Just so you know. All right. Uh, half, the problem, half the problem, Chris, is that most of the, these folks who are in business positions with teams either are, A, happy, just happy to be there, or, B, they think winning is the end-all, be-all to, to generating revenue, and it's not. Now, don't get me wrong. Does it help? Sure. But if you don't build the proper structure, and if you don't have the proper protocols, if you don't know how to build relationships with your clients, and, you know, it's not about saying, hey, I need you to buy design. It, that, that, those days are long gone. It's all about knowing what they want, 
creating something to help them achieve their goals. And if you do that, they're going to be with you forever. And that's that's why Johnny right now, when John, before Johnny took over, they were more of a transactional organization, the, the Giants. Now they're signing three, four, five-year deals because they want to build off of uh, you know what the Giants can bring. The assets that the Giants have are very valuable. Well, I like what he said. I and he, by the way, Lou, you owe John big time for that compliment. Uh, that was really nice of what he said about you. And you just said it. You followed up. The question is, it's not about winning. How do you market a crappy organization, teams that don't win? It seems like you did that. And how did you build that up? Well, you know, when I started with the Patriots, sponsorship was about sixteen million. Uh, and that included suites as well, suites, sponsorship, and, and some sort of hospitality. Uh, it was a very transactional way that they operated. We, we, I came from radio. John and I and, and the group, we would spend time and invest time in people, uh, build relationships, go out with them. You know, John, he, he does most of his business on the golf course, or at least he used to. I don't know if he still does. But we would invest so much time in these people that they trusted us, they believed in us. And not only that, we knew so much about them, we knew how to help their business and help them achieve their goals. That's what we did at the Patriots. We stopped selling signs. Yes, we used that to recognize revenue, but we really wanted to put together programs to help people do great things to achieve their goals. And Because at the end of the day, if you make your client look good to their bosses, they're going to be with you forever, right? And that's all exactly. we did. Then, once we built that and we started winning and built a brand new station, it was a stadium. It was a it was lightning in a bottle, and we really we went from that uh, we went from 16 million to 24 in the old building before we had any victories and before Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. But then once we had it, we went from 24 to 92. So that leap was extraordinary. But we we were positioned. And Chris, okay. yes, take a look at the. You know, you could probably answer this question better than we could because you live in Dallas. Yes. And Dallas hasn't won a thing in 10 years, and yet Dallas is the top revenue producer in the league. And, you know, and, and they're still resting on the old Dallas Cowboys. That's America's team and all that nonsense, yes. You know, but, but, you know, a lot of it has to do with the organization. Look, they got a bunch of guys at the top, Jerry Jones being one of them, um, and even with the Patriots, the Kraft family, they, they, they get out there and sell. They, they, they don't sit, you know, they don't let someone else run the business. Uh, Jerry said Jerry's in on every sales call. Bob and Robert and uh, Jonathan Kraft are in on every big deal. Um, they they live the business side of it. Yeah, uh, a little different with New York where they live the football side of it. They don't really get the, the families don't get that involved in the business side. Um, but you know you, you need the business leader to do that. But your market in particular because that team hasn't won a, a, a don't make me rub a lime juice in your paper cut here. But that team hasn't won a thing in a long time. Yeah, the last time the last time they won was ninety five. I was fortunate to cover uh, every team every uh, coach since eighty nine to two thousand seven. Got to flu with the team. I know Jerry really well. And uh, Jerry I'll never forget this. Jerry once told me, I said, Jerry, how do you handle all this? All this criticism. It was Yates, I don't care wh what they say about me, as long as they talk about me. Right. And he didn't yeah. care. He was one of the best marketers I've ever met. And it was like I I would cover that team when they had Quincy Carter, and I thought, they're going to suck. But he convinced me that they're going to go to the damn playoffs. And I believed him because he sold me on it. If you can sell me on that with the team that they had, he was the greatest marketer of all time. Now, they did make the playoffs one time with that quarterback. But he can do that, and it's just something about him. He's got the stadium. He's got the – and look, the, the, pro, the thing about the Cowboys, you're saying how do they do it? People either love them or hate them. They're not a team, no offense to the Jacksonville Jaguars or these just, <laughs> that just don't have any relevance unless you're in Jacksonville. The Cowboys, you either hate them or love them. And they're <laughs> always popular, and their ratings are always great. So that's how he makes all that money. Chris, He's the, a whole player. Oh, I want to see this. The key, is, the key is the ownership really is the key to revenue because you, you have certain owners that believe – if you do activities that generate revenue, it's going to prevent you from winning. And that's just not real. It, you have to know that there's a balance. And the crafts were, were the masters at it because I would go to them and say, I need 50, 50 seats in the team playing. I want to sell them. And they would say to me, can you, can you make some money? Yes. Okay. They'd call in Belichick and said, if we give Lou 50 seats, will that make you lose games? And if they said, if he said, yes, it'll make me lose games, then he said no to, they said no to us. But if he didn't, 
they gave it to me. And nine times out of ten, Belichick's not going to say that would make him yeah. lose games, right? Yeah. That's interesting. So does that answer your question about Jerry as well? Because that's what he does. I mean, he's yeah, selling you know, Victoria's, Victoria's Secret stuff at the stadium. <laughs> Did you know that? With logos on it? No, he's, he's the first guy to open a Victoria's Secret store in the stadium. Did y'all know that? Oh, wow. No, I didn't know that. He has yeah. How's it like doing? dancing girls in cages. No idea. <laughs> he does have girls in cages pretty close. Have you been to the game? They've got girls on the poles up in the upper level. Jeez. Dance. No. Do they sell their um, sponsorship um, attire? Like I know the pink brand version of Victoria's Secret, they have um, like an NFL line of um, clothing for women. For women. Um, so I was curious if they do that at the stadium, is it only just Cowboy stuff or does it include other teams as well? Jerry would never sell anybody besides Cowboys. <laughs> and I think he sells <laughs> Cowboy toilet paper. You can buy that as well. Let me take that one on, Chris. Um, the Cowboys are the only team in the league that has that have their own marketing rights and merchandise rights. They don't participate in any of the league functions, so they don't split the revenue that the league takes out. They have their own line of everything. How does that allow? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'd like uh, to know. That. That's a really good question. Uh, is, is it because it grandfathered in? They they were there a long time uh, ago. No, it has. You know, you can opt out of those things. But it, it really, you know, like the Maras and the, the Giants, they always try and do what benefits the team most and the league most. The, the Cowboys are every man for themselves. And they do a great job with it, so you got to tip your hat to them. I know. I've never – I've always wondered that. I've always been curious about that, how they can get away with that. All right, Kempton, you had a question? Guys, by the way, you all need to ask questions because the show's wrapping up. Uh, we got John on here and Precious Time and also Lou. Uh, we got him on at, what did we get you all on at, uh, 30 after? So we usually run 30 minutes. We've got about six minutes left on the show, folks. So yeah. if you want to ask so, a question, you got to dive in. Kempton, so let, so, in. So let me give it a try. Uh, Lou and John, a, qu a question for you. So on the on the Super Bowl night, uh, during the power outage time, Oreo had a coup. They had that uh, ever uh, the tweet post out, and that get uh, I think over twelve thousand uh, retweet within that hour. And because they have a control center, the client was there, the creative was there. So I want to ask you guys, what would the lessons that you guys take, or, or you think the team uh, or people in this space should learn from from that uh, that? That success, uh, I, I think. Well, I'll start just because we have the Super Bowl here next year. So we're facing, and, and when we first opened the stadium, our third game, we had the exact same thing happen. Against the Cowboys, all the lights went out on, a, I think it was a Thursday night game. Um, and, and the Cowboys won that game, but the, the stadium went totally dark. Now, it's one thing to be totally dark in Louisiana and have a few lights on where it's air conditioned. And, but it's another thing next year, if it's 10 degrees outside, okay, it's 7.30 at night and all the lights go out and you're in New York City. That's going to be a different deal. <laughs> so, <laughs> I can it imagine, did not happen. I can imagine that what you're going to find is um, you're going to find more energy companies with generators, backup generators, backup, backup, backup generators, and backup, 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 backup generators <laughs> to, to go on. And, and the, the lesson to learn is, is – you know, you can imagine how much they, they probably spent $100 million on the engineering of this particular Super Bowl, and they still, okay, this is like the, the Super Bowl down in Dallas. They plan for every single thing but an ice storm. If it we haven't had an ice storm in decades. It, if it can't happen, it will, if, if, if there's such a thing as a mud storm, it will happen on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> you know yeah, what the <laughs> degree was this past weekend at the Super Bowl here in Dallas? 72 degrees. It was the the craziest thing that's ever happened here. You know, I I I'd like to to talk about the fact that I I was I grew up in radio and in radio everything is instantaneous and you have to be on your toes and you have to be writing, doing, changing and and doing whatever you can to be ahead of the game and the biggest problem with advertisers and fat cat ad agency creative directors is they spend six months a year to create what they think is the end-all be-all uh, and they and then they go to these the Super Bowl parties or they go to their game and they're, they're drinking booze and they're, they're eating <laughs> and they're not paying attention to their job. Mm -hmm. Every company 
uh, everybody sh who's involved in the Super Bowl or believes the Super Bowl can can increase revenues for their brand and cre increase exposure as well should not only be paying attention, they should be morphing what they've created during the game. If I was a generator company like Kohler, I would have been on the phone with CBS and I would have had an ad right out of the uh, – Right out of the um, uh, first break, because everybody would have loved that. Oreo was mm -hmm. smart to do what they did. I mean, it was a stretch. Yeah. You can dunk Very in the good. dock. I mean, but yeah. they jumped on it. So nobody else did. Credit for that. Mm -hmm. Nobody else jumped on that. That was creative. Pam, you got a question? Yeah, um, John. Just a quick question about um, crisis management. Um, I guess for next year's um, big Super Bowl. So, judging from what happened this past year, what? kind of plan do you want to have in place if something like that happens where you've got a lot of dead time, you don't really know how to fill it potentially, and uh, you know, 80% of the tickets that are used for the Super Bowl are for corporate sponsorship. So what kind of plan would you want to have in place um, to kind of prevent or kind of micromanage what's going on if, in case there is like a really big problem for next year? Well, the two things that I was very surprised at, well, the broadcast teams weren't ready with it, with a plan, with, with a disaster plan. I mean, it took them 10 minutes just to realize the lights were out. It took them 10 minutes to, to get everyone back in their booths to start talking, to start moving. So, so they went to the only place they could go, which was the sideline reporter who had no information. So he looked like a dog. Um, then you have to engage the fan. You have to. You 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 probably need a team of people just to shoot T-shirts or do something to, to to capture the crowd's attention. And you know you can't have people standing there doing nothing because if that had gone on 15 more minutes, fights would have broke out. It would have been it would have been a melee. If but think about that. If it was in 10 degree weather in New York City at nine o'clock on a Sunday night, it's gonna get crazy. So so you 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 know you got to do a couple things. I was surprised there was no show of force. Usually when something like that happens, you see the mounted police walk out and you see 500, you know, 500, you know, National Guard surround the stadium. I was very surprised we didn't see that. I think they were very, very fortunate that they didn't have a crisis, a real, you know, the lights were a crisis, okay, but the fact that nothing happened to result was the real savior of the whole day because something really ugly, the front page could have been six dead. It's Super Bowl melee because the lights go out. You know, someone falls off the balcony, all those things. And I don't think they thought, boy, if the lights go out, what could happen? Um, if this happened, what could happen? You know, there's a, a series of a million things that could happen during the course of a Super Bowl or in any particular game. And if you're not ready with the plan to either evacuate people, to move people, um, to calm people down, and I didn't see any of that, and, it, and, and I, I'm hoping it's because they thought they had half the lights on and had it under control, but I was amazed I didn't see 500 National Guard out there. I was amazed at the things I didn't see. Maybe they had it behind the scenes, and maybe they had it covered, which will come out over time, but with all with the $100 million it takes to put on a Super Bowl, boy, I didn't see safety precautions like I, I, I would have expected. Yeah. Well, in honor of that question, why don't why don't we just ask the next question in the dark? Everybody, turn your camera <laughs> off. We'll do a blackout real quick. This will be kind of interesting. So, everybody, do a blackout. We're gonna do a little Super Bowl blackout. Uh, John, your camera thing is up there. You hit the camera deal. All right, Robert. Robert, you're the only one lit up, and and John is the only one lit up. Perfect, Robert. You can ask a question to John now in the dark. Go ahead. <laughs> I can't hear him. I can't hear you, Robert. Hi, right, there Are we you go. muted? Right. Yep. Should be good. Uh, hi, John. Thanks for coming on. Uh, I'm a UMass Amherst student uh, studying sport management, and uh, I've gotten a few internships and sponsorships so far. And I was wondering if you have any advice from uh, the beginning of your career in sponsorship as to you know how to get to where you are today working in the NFL sponsorship. I, I do. I see an awful lot of kids. I, I interview an awful lot of kids. I am amazed at everyone who does the cookie cutter stuff. Uh, same resume, same cover letter, same I'm a people person speech. Um, you know, this is going to sound. I apologize for what I'm about to say, but I say this to every kid I see. Okay. I say this to everyone who comes in and does, don't be a pussy. Just come in and <laughs> just, just tell them what you want, fight for your job. <laughs> You know, if you go in there and you tiptoe in, I'm gonna eat you. I'm gonna throw you out the window. I want nothing to do with you. And, and that's, um, you know, it's funny because um, I say that I say that unilaterally, and I mean it in the small cat kind of way. 
Um, look, you have to really um, show people what you want to do. And if you come in there and you tiptoe in, look, I'm going to see 100 people in a month, okay? One's going to capture my attention. If it's not you, you know, get to the back of the line, and, and that's the truth. Um, I have a 26-year-old kid who, a gal, blonde gal, great kid, sugar and spice and everything nice, who chew you up and spit you out. Okay, she's so aggressive. Um, you don't have to be that, that, that type A personality, but you do have to be ready for the interview. You have to be willing to do whatever, you know, you just, you know, if, if one person, one more person says, I'm going to get my foot in the door, I'm going to chop his foot off. Um, you want to run the company. You, you want to yeah, move sure. the wall. Okay? So don't <laughs> make no impression at all. Okay? Make it go big or go home. That's go New home. York style, baby. Yeah, and Robert, I'd, I'd add to that. I would say leave and check your jersey at the door because we we don't want any fans working for us. Because oh, you know what? If you think Perfect. like a fan, you're not thinking like a, a business person. I love mm -hmm. the fans. I wanna I wanna provide them with a, a good time and a, and and fun opportunity. But I don't want them working for me. I got to be honest. Gentlemen, uh, we got about two minutes to go. We've talked about everything from uh, Super Bowls to marketing to business. <laughs> Got to ask this one to end the show, for goodness sake. Let's go down the aisle. What was the best commercial? Who did the best? And all you people that are quiet, and I'm putting you on the darn spot. First, Ann, what did you think? Super Bowl commercial. Do you have one? What did you like? Oh, yes, the Taco Bell one. <laughs> Taco Bell, okay. With the, the old folks escaping from the nursing home. <laughs> all right, I'll be next since I'm next on the line. I'm going to go with a, uh, I don't know, something's in my brain. Budweiser, Budweiser. I don't know. It seems like it's right here. <laughs> it's my, oh, and tonight's sponsors, by the way. Uh, Bud Light, the official sponsor of the NFL. Here we go. JetBlue, book now at JetBlue.com and UPS. Do more with UPS. I love the Clydesdale one. I almost cried. That may made me wimpy, but I don't care. Yes. I loved it. And USA Today voted it the number one. They won the number one commercial. So I'm going with Budweiser, King of Beers. How about you, Diana? You know, I'm with Ann. I love the Taco Bell one. It was amazing, and I would have not expected it. So yeah, that's was completely unexpected. John, can you give an answer to this one? Well, first I'm going to say I'm going to get you tissue, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a cry. If, if, if it was on sheer, um, which one do I remember the most? It's the kiss. The GoDaddy kiss was. I, I, wow, I, me too. Yeah. I said, you stole my answer, John. <laughs> if, if, if the answer is which one do I remember the most and which one got the most effect out of me, that was absolutely the funniest thing I've ever seen. I, I, I don't know if that was hot or gross. Apparently, <laughs> according to um, uh, a couple websites, they said that the takes to do that commercial and the ad, took, they took uh, 65 kisses before they yeah. oh, I bet you that I've been guy, messing that, that up the whole time. Hey, I, I messed up. Let's do it again. Cut. Yeah, I bet you that geek guy wanted that to happen so many times. <laughs> like, oh, she's messing up. <laughs> Captain, what did you think? Same answer. Like it's memorable, right? And that is the job. So it doesn't look good when it doesn't have breasts. Fine. Hey, you remember Go Daddy, and that's exactly what they want, <laughs> they want <laughs> us. Yeah. Kent, because you were thinking that was you, man. That's what you were like in that one. <laughs> yeah, right. I wish. Keith, what do you got? I, I yeah, I like the Go Daddy one. I just wanted to be that little kid. Lou. <laughs> You know, I really enjoyed the uh, official airline of uh, the Embryanos. <laughs> <laughs> I really liked it. <laughs> no, Jet Blue, baby. If I was going to be, uh, I love the way Jeep came out of the halftime. I thought it was, I know it might have been a little bit sentimental, a little bit, but I, I liked the way they did that. It was classy, and, and you know, if you're a Jeep type of person, uh, you'd get into that. So I, I, we own a Jeep, and I think I like that. Now, now tell me, tell me, because there were so many car commercials. Which one was that one? Was that the, uh, the farmer one? You know, no, with the military came out at the, you know, when they they started. It, was it? Was it? Okay. Yes, I remember that. Okay. Yeah, that one. Pam, what do you think? My favorite was the NFL Network spot with Leon Sandcastle. That's uh, pretty good. Leon Sanders. I thought that it was just. I, I laughed hysterically out loud throughout the entire thing, and I just thought it was really creative. They actually had created a Twitter handle for it as well and are kind of joking back and forth at the NFL about it, so I, that, that definitely was my favorite of the night. Robert? Uh, I had two, if that's allowed. 
Uh, I like the Audi one towards the beginning where the kid comes out of his car, goes in the prom, and just drives out. That was a good one. Oh, yeah. And then, uh, a little biased. I like the Samsung one, probably because I'm part of the Galaxy family. But I thought yeah. it was pretty good. <laughs> Seth Rogen, Paul Rudd, yeah, little a little LeBron one. cameo. Charles? Well, I watched online, so I missed about half of them. But I'd have to say out of the ones that I did see, it was the Budweiser one as well. Yes! <laughs> By the way, our sponsor tonight. No, is that <laughs> Hey, man. <laughs> Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you uh, to John McGuire, uh, Lou Embriano. Thank you guys for coming on. Uh, I know Lou's been on our show before. John, what did you think about a Google Hangout? And uh, next time, if you want, uh, bring Eli Manning with you, and we'll uh, – look, I'll help you gain sponsorships. We'll do some Google Hangouts for you guys. Wow. Wow, this is great. Thank you. Nice to meet you all, guys. Thanks for joining. Did Thanks, you enjoy guys. the Google Hangout? Was this your Absolutely. first one? Really appreciate you coming on. My pleasure. Great hangout, and John. Unfortunately, Dude. J.W. Cannon was sick tonight. He will get him on again another time. Everybody, I appreciate you, and thank you for coming on. Diana, John McGuire, Kempton, Keith Knox, Lou and Briano, Pam, Robert Hanlon, and also Charles. We'll go off the air, and, uh, and then we'll sign off. Thanks, everybody. Next week, we have another great show. Uh, I think we're going out of space with NASA, supposedly. Oh. All right. Good night. <laughs>